All right, hey everybody. Welcome back to our next featured speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce Carrie Fisher. Carrie is an author, speaker, and developer who is passionate about the intersection of front-end code and UX, digital accessibility, and promoting diversity in the tech world. Now I will hand it off to this party person, Carrie Fisher. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like we need a more introduction, the party people song. Um, but yeah, thank you, April. Thank you, uh, the team at Asheville for uh, asking me to speak and for everyone. It's been awesome to see all of your faces um, virtually uh, here at Asheville camp. Um, earlier, I was wearing my Asheville shirt, but I wanted to show you this one. Uh, this is a Black Lives Matter shirt. So if, when you're going online to Bonfire and you're gonna be purchasing your Asheville camp shirt, uh, take a look for that campaign as well. It's pretty awesome. And it's nerdy fun because, you know, code. <laughs> so, all right. So I want to make sure that I'm on the screen. All right. So as April said, uh, my name is Carrie Fisher. Uh, I am a senior accessibility consultant and trainer. I do a lot with uh, the training department at uh, DQ Systems. And for people who are more in the Drupal world and not in the accessibility world, uh, DQ Systems, we work with different teams and clients. Uh, we build accessible uh, components and um, libraries, and again, like training and education as well. Um, but before I did accessibility, I did work in higher ed and a couple Drupal agencies uh, as a front end dev for about 15 years. Uh, fun fact. As my first major dev job with Drupal uh, was a migration from Drupal 4 <laughs> to Drupal 6. And I had no knowledge of the platform at all at that time. Uh, so that was a, a fun learning moment. Um, so I've been around for a little bit, even if I'm not specifically Drupal these days. All right. So when it comes to informing the public about critical health issues, timing is everything. The information you consume today could literally save your life tomorrow. And with more than 65% of the population being visual learners, meaning they learn and remember best through visual communication, the job of creating and sharing accessible images has never been more important. So this is especially true for public service announcements aimed at providing crucial and urgent information to the public. Um, and when I wrote this, uh, COVID was the hot topic, but this could be applicable to any PSA really. Um, so what happens when your users have visual impairments or maybe they have dyslexia or cognitive disorder? How do people with these kinds of disabilities receive and understand visual information? So what elements essentially make an image accessible or inaccessible? To help provide some more accessible images, we'll go over some of the different types of images and their corresponding messages. Um, that's also called alternative text. And then we're going to dive into some real world examples of inaccessible images and discuss which elements matter most when critical message uh, needs to reach everyone. So today I kind of did, I grouped them into image types and alts, color and contrast, topography and layout, and copy and icons. All right, first up, let's talk about the different types of images and how to provide alternative information about your images to all your users. Uh, the World Health Organization estimates there are about 39 million people who are blind and about 246 million who have low vision around the world. So that's a total of 285 million roughly uh, who might be using assistive technology device. Uh, the big one that we hear about all the time is screen readers. Uh, so this is what this section is targeting really. AT devices uh, beyond that is, include like speech to text or some, some way that the text is actually speaking to the person. So back and forth. So this is a huge piece of your audience if you're forgetting, um, if you're not thinking about your image alt message. But just again, taking a step back before we talk about the methods, we're gonna talk about uh, the how the message is delivered. We need to talk about the why of the image. So first, the first question I always ask is, what is the purpose of the image? Is it to enrich? Is it to inform? If it is to inform, what is the next step you want your client or user to take? Do you want it, them to take an action? Do you want to just tell them a message? If you're telling them a message, what type of message are you trying to convey? Is it simple, complex, emotional? By asking the questions, what type of message is the Im image trying to convey? And is the message simple, complex, emotional, actionable? 
Uh, those kind of like basic questions will help you determine how best to convey the image information to a person using an AT device. Um, this is a simple one that I just created for this talk, uh, but there are also online tools. The WCAG has a great image description tree. Um, or of course, you know, you can take this uh, from the slide deck and, and use this one as well. But ultimately, even if you're not doing, you know, a decision tree, this are the things that you're thinking in your head. It ultimately comes down to this question, like what is the message? Um, so like what I like to tell people is that you imagine your image has vanished. And then you ask yourself, do I understand the content that remains? If the answer is yes, the image is, is decorative. If it's not, the image is informative and contextually necessary. So we'll look at an example first of a decorative image. So in this example, we see a giant letter S and a drawing of a black cat with a green eye uh, used to make the drop cap for uh, the Smashing Magazine article look a little bit more fun and interesting. But when we remove the drop cap illustration, what changes? Certainly there's a visual difference between the cat being there and a not, uh, but no information is really lost here. In this particular case, we're looking at this code. This is real life code. Uh, so as, as we know, real life code can be uh, both good and bad and somewhere in between. So in this particular case, we're seeing both aria hidden true and an empty null alt uh, to hide the image with the assistive technology devices. While this kind of redundancy is not necessary to make it accessible, it is also not harmful in this particular situation since the div only contains images we want to hide. Uh, but this is a good point to remember, like when it comes to accessible code, more is not always better. So make sure you know what you're doing. So the big takeaway for decorative images is if your image is decorative, then programmatically the image needs to be hidden. There are many ways to hide images using an empty null, many ways to hide these kind of images, including an empty null. Uh, that's not to be confused with an, a missing uh, alt attribute. So this is just alt and then quote, quote, there's no space in between, even though it kind of looks like that on the slide. It's just the font that I'm using. Or you could use ARIA. ARIA is big, right? Role equals presentation, role equals none, ARIA and true. So again, various places that you're going to use certain different things like, there we go, or CSS background. So just one quick point, uh, we did talk about the empty all net, uh, null alternate, the, Empty null alternative text attribute is not the same as a missing alternative te text attribute. So if the alternative text is missing, the AT device might see something like it might read the file name, it may read surrounding content uh, in, in an attempt to give the user more information. Um, and just like in the example we saw earlier, when we use aria hidden true, this is an option to hide images, but be cautious because when you add it, you apply it to the entire element. So you basically remove the entire element from the accessibility API, which is not always a good thing. But pr beyond programmatically hiding your image, there's not a lot much more you need to know when it comes to decorative images. So if you're saying, but wait, what about X or how about Y? Then you may need to go back and reevaluate the image description using those the tree tools or just kind of the thought process. It might not be 100% decorative after all. One of the most difficult types of images to categorize tends to be that emotional slash mood based images since it's a subtype and it's a little bit subjective. So what one person considers decorative, another person might consider informative. So you have to use your best judgment. And this is also a team decision. I've talked to a lot of people uh, while I've been working at DQ about, you know, do you, would you rather have these emotional, um, so emotional images are ones that are kind of like making you feel something about the page. So what example I would have is like a person riding a motorcycle and the wind is in their hair and they look free and happy, right? Um, how do you convey that image? Do you just say man on motorcycle, right? That's not really conveying that, that feeling that you're trying to convey. So um, some people who use AT devices, they wanna hear all about that. They wanna know about the wind. They wanna know about the, the flowers and the birds and everything, but other people say, hey, if I don't need to know about this particular thing, um, I don't necessarily need it uh, to be described as well. So again, this is kind of a judgment call. All right, so moving on from decorative, let's look at an informative image. 
An example of an informative image we've seen on many websites before, in this particular case, I'm showing the DQ website. So up in the top left-hand corner usually is the logo. So we've asked the same question before, does the context or content change if this image is missing? So now it's gone. So in this particular case, the answer is yes. We not, we're not really sure what website we're on if it's not told to us um, if we're using an AT device. So in this example, the logo is both informative and it's also actionable because it's both an image and a link. So if we inspect the logo, we see it's an SVG and it's utilizing ARIA labeled by and a title plus a little screen reader uh, only tag span. So in this case, we have the, the span class and like the second line here is called SR only. In the CSS, we have some information about hiding it from visual users, but still being able to read it. So in this particular case, we're gonna hear DQ, DQ logo. So a little bit redundant, we probably can clean that up a little bit, but it's definitely informative. For AT devices to understand the message or intent of an image, informative images must programmatically discernible alternative text. So typically this is accomplished using the image alt. So this is the place where you would be using some information in this particular case, I just write info, but obviously that would be a little bit more uh, descriptive. But there's also alternative ways to do this. Our friend Aria is back with Aria Label and then Aria Labeled By. So the Aria Labeled By is a little bit more complex. What it's showing here is an ID relationship. And so you would have like a span or a P or something that would have that specific ID on it as well, it would have additional information. So again, programmatically, this information would be conveyed but visually it wouldn't, you wouldn't see anything. Another one people kind of forget a lot about is just plain old HTML. Um, there's no reason why you couldn't just put in, like we had on the DQ logo, a span that's only shown to screen readers and not visually. Or you could take it to the next level and think about people with cognitive disabilities or other disabilities that may also need that visual representation. So just throwing that out there. So that's more for the image tag. This is the SVG one. So unfortunately, there's no alt, traditional alts in the way that we know it for SVGs. Um, but we do have this thing where we can use an ARIA label, or ARIA labeled by before. But SVGs also have these special tags like title, text, and description. So I almost think of title as kind of the, um, the alt for SVGs. Uh, note over here too is that making sure that we add the role IMG to all informative SVGs. If we have a decorative SVG, we just wouldn't add that role and then the AT device would skip over it. Or you could even write in the role or an ARIA like hidden or something like that. You could do uh, role equals presentation. It's doing the same thing. But by default, screen readers are going to skip over SVGs assuming that they are only decorative. So you don't necessarily need that. The only time you want to do it is when it's informative. All right. But having alternative text is great, but of course it's not enough. It also must be meaningful. For example, if your image is about feeling safe at home, but your alternative information says house, does that convey the full message? For a more complex alternative text phrases, I like to conduct the telephone te test. So if you call up your friend, uh, and I think Donna and Amy Jean have heard this one before, but if I call them up and I said, hey, snail, and I hung up, they'd be like, what, what's going on? Uh, so they might think of a snail, but in what context? Is it just like a snail munching on some lettuce, some sort of psychedelic snail? Again, that's for Amy June specifically. Uh, snails, facial there, or Gary the snail. But if I call my friend and I said, the snail is eating my hydrangeas, that would paint a much more vivid picture without adding a lot of additional characters or effort. Um, of course, the AT user will have to listen to your alternative text. So don't go overboard, just be nice. Um, that was why it's suggested to cap your te alternative text about 150 characters, which is quite a lot once you start counting characters. Um, and if you have to add more, if you need more context, like a complex image, uh, infographic, graphs, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of other more descriptive patterns or methods you wanna use for those. So we're just talking about basic images in this particular case. All of that being said, <laughs> that was a lot. I need to 
uh, maybe be a little less nervous. But yeah, all that being said, there is a world beyond image alts. Uh, so it's important to note that the image alt text is important and addresses the needs of screen reader users. But as we mentioned earlier, a lot of people with disabilities don't rely on screen readers. Uh, they may use other AT devices like browser resizing, customized style sheets, magnification software to help them see what is on the screen. So to these people, screen reader output is probably not as important to them as other elements such as color, contrast, topography, layout, copy, and icons, which is kind of like the point of the rest of, of the talk. But I wanted to make sure we got that foundation of how to deal with basic imagery. So, but there is a world beyond image alts, believe it or not. And it's scary like this guy. Um, this is a hand in case you're not, in case you're visually impaired, but it's hand with a bunch of push pins that look like they're glued to a hand with um, fingernails. And this is actually a PSA from the United Nations says, avoid touching your face. I think it's very illustrative. Um, so again, without a lot of text, without a lot of context, um, I think the point gets across pretty easily. So again, we're gonna make sure that our, if this is an informative image, we're gonna let people know in the different various ways to do that um, using alt methods. But going beyond alts and considering ex uh, additional image elements using real PSA examples. So that's what we're gonna do next. So in each example, we're gonna look at the image through the lens of a different type of disability. And we're gonna keep in mind that simulators um, and tools, uh, these do not represent individuals' true experience. Um, this is kind of getting us in that mind frame. By using these tools, we can begin to build some empathy into our designs and our code and really consider what the different ways our images are being consumed. So again, just to be clear, examples are illustrative and educational only. Um, it's not meant to call out or otherwise pass judgment about the designers or uh, <laughs> illustrators in question. Um, and there also might be multiple issues in, in one PSA, but we're just gonna focus on one at a time. Um, and there'll be a lot of opportunities for improvement in the area of digital communication when the dust settles on COVID-19, hopefully, and accessibility is just one of those areas that we're considering. All right, color and contrast. This is the beating heart of design um, is color arguably. So if, if color is the heart, then I think of contrast as the muscle. So without good color contrast levels in place elements like words, icons and other graphical shapes are hard to discern and design can quickly become inaccessible. But again, we're asking the question, what happens if you perceive color and contrast differently than others? Uh, does the same message and intent come through? How do you reach people with color sensing issues like color blindness? Uh, we estimate that it's over 300 million people worldwide are colorblind. So that's a lot of people and experiences to consider. But color and contrast also affects people with partial sight, older adults, and people in certain situations. I think we've all been in a situation like that with low lighting in a room uh, when we could go places and on public transport or in the car, the screen glare on, the, on a device. Uh, so the number of actual people you can reach with accessible color and contrast is much higher. All right, so here's our first review. Uh, we're looking at the PSA from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, also known as CDC. Um, and this is paired up with a nonprofit group called the Ad Council. This is kind of the, <laughs> the ad that started it all. Uh, this is kind of slash my rant uh, about this because when I first saw this on Twitter and then it was in a very small space, I saw that bottom right one, which is uh, tan with a light color. I'm like, I can't even see this on my device. Like how, do, how are people with colorblindness or other issues, low vision, like how are they seeing these? And these are arguably the ones that you're targeting, the people, the population you're targeting the most, right? Over 65 or the elderly at the time um, was, was are the real focus for the, a lot of these PSAs. So, um, so yeah, this is actually the PSA grouping called the higher risk uh, COVID-19. Again, these are my, not my words. These are the uh, the Ad Council and the CDC's words. But uh, these, in, these PSAs are pretty. I mean, they incorporate a variety of striking color choices. They're visually appealing, one could argue. Uh, but when testing the text against the background for these images, many of the combinations do not pass the web content accessibility guidelines for the color contrast ratios. I'm going to break that down in a little bit in case that's new to you. But 
This is true even before we edit them with these um, filters for colorblindness. Um, but when you see when we add these simulators for colorblindness and low vision, it gets the contrast ratios get even worse. So here's one. So I'm using the Chrome's, Chrome Lens extension. And again, this is a simulator um, trying to get you in that mindset of what it might be, not individual, um, uh, not what an individual necessarily would see. Like it, it's a, it runs a gamut. It's not a black and white kind of situation here. But this tool includes a lens vision simulator. It transforms the colors. This one is simulating red, green color blindness. So again, if there's any people uh, watching with visual impairments, we went from like a teal blue and a light kind of a lighter blue and a salmon color to more of a purple color and like a lime greenish color. Uh, this next one is a red week. And we can see again, this is the original is like the teal and the pink. And we get to a blue and a kind of orangey kind of color. And ironically enough, the, uh, the tan one kind of just stays tan the whole time. Uh, but the other ones are pretty more uh, obvious how they change. And okay, so using this one's using a different simulator called the No Coffee Vision Simulator. Um, I'll get these links to you if they're not already available um, on the noticed uh, side. But we can see how these PSAs might look to someone with low vision. So this is applying the low vision simulator. And this is the one with the cataract simulator. So if we go back and we break down some of the color contrast ratios found with the PSAs, again, we're kind of looking at individual sections here. So if I'm testing the have, the word have against the background, first of all, I know that it's large font. It's at least, so it needs to be 4.5 to one for regular size for three to one. So in this particular case, the ones that I'm testing and showing have to have a ratio of three to one. That means that the text has to have a contrast ratio between the text and the, and the background of, of that ratio, right? And so there's a lot of different ways to uh, test color contrast ratios. There's tons of tools out there. Um, the one that I'm using here is the color contrast analyzer. And the reason why I like it is because you don't need hex, you don't need code. Uh, you would do it on a design, on um, any platform. You can even like spot check things like your app colors in the background, uh, your image background on your computer. So you can pretty much check anything. It doesn't have to have, again, like a code. So in this particular case, we see we have a 1.26 for the word have and 1.86. And again, this is the original. This is the one with, uh, oh, the red, red week, red green week. So we have 1.07 to one for the word have, and here we have the 1.27 to one. And then we have this other one, which is the red week. And so we have a 1.15 and 1.52 to one. So again, we want a three to one. So we're failing on all of those. This is the same kind of testing, only we're looking at a different color, the blue one, just in case you thought I just picked out the worst one. Uh, the blue one is actually a little bit worse than the salmon color one. We have 133 and 199. And this is showing the low vision, right? Again, the contrast ratio changes aren't dramatic. You know, 125 to 133, or 152 to 199. So it's not as dramatic as the, the color changes, but you can see how contrast plays um, a big role in this as, as well. This is the low vision, and this is the cataract one. So again, depending on where you spot check, you got a 1.06 and 1.85. Uh, so a lot of people blame, the point of this la these last two is like a lot of people blame color for their design accessibility issues. Uh, but these examples kind of illustrate the contrast plays a key role as well. So without changing the colors on this PSAs, but by changing the user perspective and blurring out some of the text, we can see that the text on the images is more difficult to read, even though the contrast ratios in some cases didn't change by much. Uh, so, of course, to make these PSAs more example, we need to bump up, increase the contrast and color on these images so people with color blindness, low vision, and other eye disorders could read the text. All right. So some takeaways here for accessible colors and contrast. We want to make sure we check the color contrast ratios. Like I mentioned, there's a ton of WCAG color contrast ratio guides and tools. Um, basically, we want our images and with copy meet a color contrast ratio of at least 4.5 to 1 for regular size text. 
And that means basically anything up to 18 points are not bold. And then three, th three to one for a large size text. So that includes 18 points or anything that's, that's bolded at a larger size. And also recently essential icons. So we'll talk about icons a little bit later. So we won't talk about that too much here, but they also fall under that color contrast ratio uh, guidelines these days. The next thing we wanna do is we wanna utilize solid backgrounds. So reading text on busy backgrounds, overlays, textures, or gradients is difficult in general, uh, but especially when the text does not have enough contrast. So using things like the Chrome lens extension to double check the color contrast or the no coffee vision simulator, can we simulate some of these issues and see how our designs hold up in these situations. Uh, quick note that the Chrome lens and the no coffee both of those extensions, I believe, are both in Firefox and Chrome. And again, you can use them on non-coded uh, content. So it's not just code, like some things that you have to grab an actual hex. And beyond the color contrast, it's also talk talking about like this idea of not using color alone to convey information. So an example of something like this would be like, contact information can be seen in red, or click the blue button to learn more. Um, same with... Um, yeah, for ads, images, any kind of code, really, it's just don't use color alone as the only identifier. All right, so topography and layout. So in a perfect world, we keep our text and images separated, and that would allow us to, and our users to manipulate the topography and layout in any way they'd want. So you might wanna change your font sizing, your letter spacing, uh, your kerning, your justification, margins, padding, et cetera, et cetera. Like all the things that the front end developers have had to deal with, right? It would be nice if someone could just come in and, and add their own style sheet and change the things that they don't like. Um, but unfortunately, we're talking about images here. Um, with static images, there's not a lot you can do. Um, some SVGs don't respond to all of the, the things that they're hard coded with some of the styles as well. So we have to kind of think about this. The separation for topography and layout can be difficult or impossible. Um, social media posts, emails, PDFs, other kinds of fixed form media we have to consider. So it's our job <laughs> to think about these. There's an estimated 15 to 20% of the world's population with dyslexia, which is considered a learning disorder with certain letters, numbers, or combinations of letters can be confusing or seem to flip or move around. Um, but with people with low vision, attention deficit disorders, other reading disabilities, uh, a complex layout is a real barrier. So these users have to have trouble keeping their place and following the flow of content due to the lack of white space and clear linear pathways. So similar to the keynote speaker earlier today when we're talking about you know, how to focus on, on things, we don't wanna make it difficult uh, for people to focus on our images, especially our PSAs. We want them to be pretty much uh, clear and straight. So here we're looking at another PSA for topography and layout. This is a PSA on the left. And what I'm gonna show you on the right side in the blue color box is uh, evaluation of, and some things that I would look or change for accessibility point of view um, if we're looking at that for topography and layout. So if you look on the left, this is from the Long Beach Health and Human Services in California, PSA. Uh, there's no nothing marked up, but then on here, the first one I'm showing are red lines, uh, red, red hand drawn lines. So what this is illustrating are multiple rivers of space created by justified alignment. So again, if you look on the left, you can see that there's some open space there where someone with, with attention de deficit disorder or low vision would might skip to different lines. So we need to keep, consider those kind of things when we're picking out our topography. Uh, the blue, botted, <laughs> blue dotted boxes, these are outlining six different layout changes. So again, keeping some of these things in mind is simplicity, right? So right now we have six different layouts. So things are changing. So every time I encounter a new layout, my brain has to think about it and figure out like what's going on. All right, pink numbers and then these, these green question marks are on the next one. So these are highlighting the 14 different topography uh, treatments discovered. And this is ignoring the logo, which is kind of exempt. So some changes are more obvious like font family changes or color changes, but more a little subtle like alignment, size, alignment or size or weight changes in the topography. 
And then the green question marks are a cognitive question. This is an equation um, with the word or in it, and the next line has a plus and an equal sign. Um, it's cognitively, this is a very difficult equation um, considering the weird layout. It's a little bit odd. You have to really like think about it for a little bit, like and or what equals, you know. So it's a lot of cognitive load for that one. And the black lines, these are the expected 12 points of visual interest. And this is assuming a UX eye tracking test based on the order of the content blocks. So in US English, that is top to bottom, left to right. Um, and the typical equation flow in this particular case, we have an equation to deal with. It's X plus Y equals Z. So you can see that the person's eye pattern is all over the place. It's not linear, it's just kind of scattered. So that's all of them together. Just <laughs> and these are these are true kind of like accessibility um, assessments, design assessments that you possibly would do. There'd be a lot more to it than that as well, but it's kind of giving you an overview of something you might see if you turned in your image or your PSA to someone to look at it. These are some of the questions that we would ask. So here's another one. This one's from the Health Department of Prince George County in Maryland, unedited. Uh, this one doesn't have any of the, the rivers of space that we saw with the red lines, so we can skip that. But we do have nine different layout changes. And again, this is talking about, I mean, these are pretty consistent, but nothing is, is ever a clone of the other. There's definitely a lot of visual differences. So that's why we're outlining pretty much every single block. This one is better than the last one. It only has 11 different topography treatments. Again, ignoring those logos. This one's a little bit better, again, than the last one, uh, but you can see we're zigzagging all over the place. This one has 10 points of visual interest. So I'm starting out at the top and going all the way to the right. Again, top to bottom, left to right, but I'm also going in order from one to six. The first time I read this one and, and was kind of looking at it, I think I totally forgot or missed number three because it's the white uh, color contrast on that number three and the background. Uh, wasn't very big, and I just kind of jumped right over to the clean because that's the part that number four that grabbed my eye. So again, this is kind of this idea of, you know, maybe number three is the most important. So we definitely want to make sure and consider like that we're making and producing a PSA or an image or even, a, you know, can you imagine any of these as websites as well? So the same thing applies to pretty much any medium. That's all the things. All right. So I showed you kind of two that you kind of know are maybe a little bit more um, not as good. This one is from the Prevention Alliance, Action Alliance out of Columbus, Ohio. They actually have a lot of really great PSAs. Here's one they have as well. So same deal, uh, blue dotted boxes. This is outlining only three different layout changes. So not too bad. And again, one could argue that they're pretty close. You might not even call it three, but yeah, in this particular case, we're talking about three. Uh, pink highlighted numbers, there's only four. There's actually the same font family is topography, like font family choice is the same throughout. The only thing that changes is font weight on one and some variations on size and color. But otherwise, they're, it's using the same one throughout the whole PSA. And as you might have guessed, <laughs> the black line and the dots, uh, we're expecting eight points of visual interest. So it is still eight points, it's a lot, but it is top to bottom. It's as linear as you can get. Um, so obviously this third PSA example is more consistent when it comes to topography, layout, and has some overall more like white space and feeling that's more open for the linear pathway compared to the first two examples. All right, oh, that's all of them. All right, so some takeaways here. Um, first one is less is more. Uh, we want to make sure that we limit the number of different font families and variations, such as italic, bold, all caps, other styling methods, and that sort of thing that would might make it difficult to read. Um, I, I was told by a good designer once is that you always want to be removing instead of adding to it, right? So when you're done and you think your, your design is done, you always want to take away at least a few things. Um, so smart, smart lady. Uh, while research is not conclusive about whether serif or sans serif face is easier, easier to read, because that's a question I hear all the time, if you're making sure that you choose a font family that clearly define letter shapes, um, it's more likely that the font will be accessible. So some common offenders I'm always looking for 
are uh, the number the number one, the lowercase l, like in lettuce, and the capital I, like the word India. So all three of those need to be distinct. I think we've all gotten like a password before from our IT guy, and it's always got like the zero. What's what's a zero? What's a what's an O? What's an I? What's a capital L? What's you know? So all these questions you kind of think about it in that context as well. So pick a font that it's easy to recognize exactly what is what. Other characters that we talk about a lot are like things like B and D, P and Q, uh, anything that can be mirrored basically. And also the, the letter B, the capital B with the number eight. Sometimes those look really close together as well. So these are some things that you're thinking about when you talk about topography. In regards to layout, less is also more. So you wanna try and repeat the patterns whenever to avoid paragraph alignment, which creates white space or those rivers of space that we saw with the red lines um, with the content justification. So line spacing also is an, an issue here in this particular case. Uh, we've got a lot of guidelines when it comes to particular sizing, like it's like a space and a half or 1.5 times larger. So you have to calculate a little bit, but I think just visually sometimes we can see like how that space is helpful. Uh, anything that's kind of crammed together is more difficult to read for most people. All right, so last but not least, let's focus on the actual PSA message. Let's talk about the copy. Uh, arguably copy is the key element when informing the public about COVID updates. In this particular case, that's the example we're using, but any PSA and providing information about uh, preventing the spread of the virus. Uh, but icons in this situation serve up more than just decoration. These visual elements repeat the same message as the copy. So no pressure, but this copy and icon combination needs to be spot on to reach the widest array of people. So again, the people, I like to always throw in some like real life people, right? 129 million people worldwide um, have issues focusing on copy that's too long. They have attention deficit disorders that primarily affects men, especially. That's why I have this image, right? A lot of us uh, here, might, this might resonate really hard. Um, same thing with um, autism and other issues that are cognitive. Um, but anyway, so breaking copy that's too long, breaks slides into lists, lacks white space. Again, that might be difficult for someone with attention deficit disorders, cognitive issues, language, learning disabilities, uh, they need visual icons, graphics, symbols to help them understand the copy as well. So we're talking about both the images and the words. All right, so again, we're gonna copy, or we're gonna test the copy of the two PSAs. This is Center for Disease Control, and I'm using the tool Readability. Uh, readability, um, or I'm testing it for readability. There's also a tool called Readability that I use. Um, but readability is the ease at which a reader can understand the written text. So readability of copy depends on both the content and presentation. So first we're gonna evaluate this one. Uh, this was what you should know about COVID-19 to protect yourself and others. So I'm, again, I'm using the tool readable and the readability test. So there's kind of different ones. And this is the output I got when I evaluated it. Uh, this particular PSA has 388 words. It has an average reading grade level of nine, uh, according to the Fleisch Kincaid reading ease uh, level. And that reading level is out of 100. So the lower the number, the more difficult the copy is to read. Um, for reference, reading ease score of 60 to 70 is considered acceptable for basic web copy. So in this particular case, we have 64.6. So we're definitely in that zone, which is great. Um, in addition to those metrics for accessible copy, we're also looking at the number of complex words and their frequency. In this case, we have 35 complex words and 9.02, um, respectively. And while the copy in the first image uh, is adequate and it falls in the suggested readability ranges, uh, let's compare it to another PSA created by the CDC at the same time. Um, similar topic, but in this particular case, we only have 90 words and our average grade level went down three to six. And the reading ease is only 83.6, or is 83.6, and the complex words are down to four. So compared to the first PSA, this PSA has 298 fewer words, it's easier to read by three grade levels, has a reading ease level increase of 19 points, and overall is just less complex. So based on these numbers, we can extrapolate that the second PSA is probably a little bit more inclusive than the first, if we're focusing only on the copy. 
All right. So this is the part that I always like the, the most. And I kind of, I'll go through it. I know we're running out of time already if, if you want some questions, but this is kind of fun. So testing the readability copy isn't the only way to measure the effectiveness of PSA when it comes to message accessibility. Another element we need to look at are the icons accompanying the copy. So if we're presented only the icons, like in this example, um, is the same message received. So kind of interested what people think uh, some of these icons are. This is a PSA from the European uh, Cyclist Federation. And I did do this on some coworkers and my family members. And I think the only one that they got really was the middle one, which is uh, social distancing. I kind of gave a one away, but I'll give you a, a few seconds here. All right, here's the here, <laughs> here are the answers. So this is the unedited PSA. Um, so the question is, is, were you able to figure out the full message? Um, I'm guessing a few of you might have been able to guess correctly on maybe a couple icons, but there's definitely icons. I have not met one person yet who got who's gotten them all. And if we look at a different one, this is from the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Pennsylvania Department of Health also has a lot of great PSAs. I've looked at hundreds of them. Uh, and this is my favorite example with the icons here. And I, I again, I sent this to my family members, even my eight-year-old. At the time he was eight, he the only one he got confused was the top number three in and the bottom one. He he didn't know the difference between first aid kit and medications, but he got them all, they all the rest of them just fine. Um, so this is the full PSA with the copy. And the question is, is were you able to figure out the full message? Um, there might have been an icon of two that tripped you up, just like my son. Um, but it's definitely easier to decipher than the icons uh, from the per first PSA versus this one, I assume. Maybe you guys can tell me I'm wrong, but that was my assumption on this one. Uh, a couple more uh, before we close up, but this one is also one of the ones that I showed people, and I was really confused by this one. In context of COVID-19, it's a little bit more obvious, but the first time I saw this, I thought it was maybe something about bullying because... It uh, looks like a group of people are talking about this man in the, the bottom. But we can see it says, stay away from mass gatherings. And I found out later that the guy that in the bottom left is also the guy in the middle. He's just wearing sunglasses and a hat. So I was really confused for a bit. But again, this is one thing to think about, especially when your PSA is only an image, right? Before we had text with image, this is pretty much only an image. So you have to think about uh, the copy, but also what kind of visual you're you're representing. Um, again, one of my favorites here, this is from the biologists of nature from Guatemala. Um, and can anyone guess what that one is? Again, I don't, I'm not checking the chats right now, so I'm, I'm not quite sure. But if you take that off, you can kind of, kind of eyeball that, you know, this person space two meters or some sort of animal uh, this is the full message here is that if you encounter each other in the street and you don't know the proper social distance, the text reads in Spanish. Imagine there's a Central American tapir between you and the other person. So related to that, this one's more geared towards uh, Americans. This is the uh, Minnesota Department of Health. So shout out to Mark uh, from Minnesota. You guys do a really good, good job on your PSAs as well. This one's a little bit more obvious than the tapir stay six feet or a bicycle length away from each other. All right, some accept accessible copy and icon next steps. So first you wanna make sure your clear and concise official rule, unofficial rule is to write for the ninth grade reading level. And this level I've found out recently is based on the assumption that most people reach 12th grade reading level. Most people will graduate high school, uh, but in peak times of stress, they might not be reading at their highest so ninth grade is why, why that magic target is, is set is for that particular reason. Um, try to use plain language and avoid technical jargon, fancy words, expressions, acronyms, abbreviations, et cetera. Um, if you need to use more complex words, make sure that you explain them in more detail and, re and tools like readable, the readability test can help you. But also I know a lot of people are, are familiar with Hemingway editor Grammarly, that sort of thing, they can give you suggestions. And a lot of times those also have uh, reading grade levels. I believe like Microsoft Word and, and Google Docs will also tell you some of those things as well. Uh, make sure you're using icons, uh, graphs, symbols, graphics, symbols, anything to supplement your copy whenever possible. 
So adding that kind of imagery allows you to break down some of those language and cognitive barriers, just like we saw in the tape here. Maybe if we didn't understand Spanish, that wasn't clear to us, but we could kind of have the idea of two meters or that animal's length apart from a, from a person. Um, you just make sure that you're choosing icons that are common and don't require a lot of thought, uh, like the European bicycle one caused us a little bit more thought process. Uh, so leaving you with this idea that creating accessible images involves a lot more than adding alt text. I hope if you get only one thing out that's what, of this talk, that's what you get. Um, it's important to consider how all image elements like color, contrast, topography, layout, copy, and icons affects your users at all. So by taking that a little bit more time and building these accessibility principles into your images, you're going to reach more people and you're going to reach them on their terms. Um, and in certain times like this, we definitely need to make sure we're addressing all the ways we can improve our images to be more inclusive. And I love this quote by uh, George Day. He's a professor at the University of Toronto. He's an exp expert on inclusion. Um, and he's talking about inclusion is not bringing people into what already exists. It is making a new space a better space for everyone, which I just love. And that's it. <laughs> I talk a lot. Uh, talking about keeping on track, right? I definitely need to, to think about things like that. But yeah, here's where you can reach me. And then if you guys have any questions, I will actually read the chat now, probably. I do see Maybe. one question Yeah, from uh, Jeff Pirtle. Uh, do you have any site examples of best practices for screen readers? And shouldn't menus and navigation be rethought for less choices to make navigation faster? Yeah, I mean, less is more in all kinds of situations, right? I mean, that's it, cohesive, concise, clear, right? There's all kinds of definitions. Um, I think the hard part when with anything accessible is that you're talking about a variety of people, a variety of disabilities, and what is good for one person might not be good for another. So I think the real big push these days is about choice. So I don't know how maybe navigation, you could have some of those choices in there, but maybe that is something that they could choose in their profile, right? Maybe they want to rearrange things or have a dashboard or something to choose the things that they want to see. Um, but yeah, there's there's some limitations, obviously, to what you can do, what you should do. <laughs> so I don't know if that answered his question, but yeah. All right, I think that's all the questions. So let's give Carrie a big round of applause. Thank you. Yes, thank you for bringing your talk.